So when you're going to represent something, uh, you also want to make sure you include graphs, right? We just talked about that at the end of the last video. And you always want to have these features. And I'm going to actually use uh, visuals here to represent that. So on any graph, you should always include a title so that the person who is looking at it knows exactly what it is when you look at it. So for example, this one is position as a function of time, right? So I also have a label for every axis. So this one is labeled X for position, and I have this one is labeled T for time. And I have in parentheses units for each of the uh, axis. So these are some basics that you have to have. You also want to have scales so that you know that what each of the, or the, or the what represents each section of the of the axis. How big is that representative in a numerical format? Right. So this is a, an example of a. Of, of, of a graph you would see in physics, for example, all the time. So you also want to correctly plot the numbers. So you want to always make sure that you do that carefully so that it makes sense. And you shouldn't extrapolate. So like, let's say, for example, that you collected data only to starting at 10 seconds and you stopped the data over here, however much time that is. You wouldn't necessarily have this these numbers. Now, even though it seems as if you could continue the pattern like this, you shouldn't do that unless you're told to, right? So you can only actually graph on what you have. So let's say, for example, you collected these data points, right? So you can go ahead and create a line of best fit that kind of goes through it. But a lot of students will do that and actually extend a line past the data that was collected. So unless you're told to do that, you shouldn't do that. Right? So you can sure not extrapolate unless uh, you're told to. Um, that's because that's data that you don't know. You don't know for sure that. It's bad enough that you're assuming that it's a straight line because it could be that it zigzags all over the place. And unless you collect like an infinite amount of points, you don't know for sure it's a line. So you're already assuming that. Going beyond the data that you collected, either before or after, it's called extrapolation. And you can do that sometimes. Sometimes it's the point, and we do that a lot in science classes. But make sure that you're told to do that before you do it, right? Uh, the last one also thing I want to talk about is this idea of what goes in each axis. So if you remember this thing, dry mix, then you will always remember that the dependent variable, which is the thing that responds in an experiment, the thing that you're me measuring, it goes in the y-axis. And then the manipulative variable, or the thing that's the, called the that you're changing, the independent variable goes in the x-axis. So that means that in here we're seeing what happens to position because of the time that's changing, right? So over time, as a function of time, what happens to position? So that actually makes sense, right? So that's how I actually it usually is graphed in a physics class. But there's other useful types of graph that you might end up using too. For example. Uh, Bar graphs are used a lot. So I have a bar graph over here. This one is rep representing the average test grades by type of mastering that a student takes. Now, these are invented data, but I'm just trying to uh, show how it would look like. So, for example, this is the grade in percentage, and this is showing a 70. And then students who took traditional classrooms, uh, on average, scored less than a 70. And then modeling would be a little bit more, PBL a little bit less, and mastery a little bit better. So this... This is used, bar graphs, to represent differences between groups, all right? But these groups were only measured once, right? The data was only measured once. So that's typically what's going to happen for a bar graph. So you're going to use bar graphs to compare several groups across one measure. You can also use the bar graph to show distribution of data. And then it just looked like a histogram. And, uh, for example, here I have grade distributions. Uh, so you have the frequency of how many students... Um, received each one of those grades, and a bar graph is kind of showing you that too, but that's really a histogram. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, another one that's useful is going to be um, line graphs. So you already saw a line graph uh, when I was showing you the basics of what you should include in a graph, but there's other kinds of line graphs. Now, this line graph is a single line line graph, which is created when you have, you're measuring something we, many times. So I measure position over multiple instances of time, right? So something measure over multiple times, line graph. But sometimes you can actually have multiple lines in a line graph. So for example, here you see the position over time for a parachute 
versus an object in free fall. So you have two different lines and you just label them differently. So I'm using multiple line line graphs to compare two things or multiple things measured more than once, right? So you're going to use those a lot as well. You can even have line graphs with two y-axis. Now these are rare. You don't see them very often. But uh, for example, in biology, this is a biome, biome climate graph where you have temperature on the left axis and precipitation on the right axis. And the precipitation is being represented by the bar graphs while the temperature is being represented by a line graph. So you can see both at work over here. So you see that you're comparing um, something, um, the different months, and you also compare at the same time the measurements of temperature across the months. So you, you, if you were looking at the line, you would look at this axis to see the numbers. If you're looking at the bars, you would look at this axis to see the numbers. And so these are rare, but sometimes they do this to represent two different features at once in a graph. Finally, um, you could also have graphs like bar graphs and pie charts to show distribution. So in, here is an example of a pie chart being used to, to show the choice of which mastering method students take took in the class. So you see that most students uh, chose modeling or mastery, and a few students chose to do project-based learning. So again, this is invented data, but it shows you very clearly the distribution of votes for something. You could also use, it looks kind of like a biograph, uh, to show the distribution of grades. So this would be like a normal curve, little a's, little f's, a little bit more D's and B's and lots of C's. That's usually what happens uh, with, the, uh, with the population if you collect large numbers of data. So pie graphs and pie charts can also be used to represent the distribution of data. You also have, can see a lot in science classes these scatter plots. So scatter plots is when you collect data on two different things. For example, this is studying data and this is the grades. So you can see that each of these points represents one data point. Now, some data falls close to the pattern, and, but some data could be outside the pattern, right? And then you can create a line of best fit that is a line that closely gets to as many points as you can. Then you can see a pattern that with more studying, grades go up, apparently. Again, this is invented data, but it kind of, this probably would be true. And so, so scatter plots are used this very often, and these lines of best fit are very common. Now, correlation is a calculation that it determines how closely, on average, these kind of numbers are to the line. And the stronger, the closer the numbers are to the line, the stronger the correlation. And that's also what we're using science, especially in situations where you can't do an experiment. So you, I don't really know that studying does cause the grades. I just know that they're related to each other. Another uh, important type of graph that we also use is scatter plots and histograms. Uh, sorry, um, histograms and box plots. And these are going to be used to show uh, the statistical distribution of data. So, for example, if this is a grades on a final exam. And you can see that the lowest grade was a 10 and the largest grade was a 99. But then most grades fell between 50 and 80, with uh, 50 being the beginning of the, of, the, of the quartile here, 70 being like your average, and 80 being the end of the third quartile. So this is used to show where most grades fell into the thing. And you can find videos of that on more detail on how to use and create these graphs. And if I ever want you to create one, I'll definitely teach you how to do that. Histograms are also used a lot to show the distribution of data. This is kind of like a histogram up there in a way because it shows how many students are on each frequency. So it's kind of like a histogram. But you basically do look at this one. Hours of study per week, right? So then you have hours on the axis. And then each box represents one person that was in that range. So it looks like most people were one, two, three, studying about four hours a week. Some were at five. Little, some people did less, and a few people even did a lot more. So that's what you use a histogram for, to show the distribution of data across that. So these are just some, some kind of graphs that you can use to represent your data. Depending on the data that you receive, you can use them. And in the file that I share with you guys, it kind of summarizes the use of each of these graphs. As far as how to create them, the best way is just to practice, and the first time you need to do that task, you will be told. As a quick review, line graphs are usually good for repeated measures, right? For when you measure something multiple times, and you can even compare two different things using two different lines. You can even have a graph with two axes at once and two different symbols to, to associate with each axis. If you want to show 
uh, distribution of data in terms of how many people pick what, uh, you can use either biographs or you can use pie charts. Scatter plots are to show correlation between data and to show statistical distribution, you want to use either hist histograms or box plots. So that's it. Hopefully this is helpful.